going to have to deal with. <laughs> Testing. Is that better? Sound creating something? Or am I just talking louder? There we are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. Well, again, good evening. Thank you. You may be seated. Even though I could make you stand. <laughs> I'm standing. I might just make you stand. No. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? Well, it's good to see everybody here. How, how many of you are here local, from, from local? Let me see your hands. All right. Good deal. How many of you are not from here local? All right. All right. Uh, I will find out, hopefully, during this time where you're from. Um, <clears throat> it's good to be back here in Louisiana again. We were here, um, well, let's see, where were we? We were in Westlake, I think it was, about a year ago or something like that. Uh, so we've been uh, here a couple of times, but our last time, the, our most memorable time uh, to date was when we got here in 1980. We actually came into Sulphur in 1980. Uh, we, were, we launched out as myself my wife, our daughter, and our son, who was just a couple of months old, actually. And uh, we left Tulsa. We'd gone to a camp meeting at Tulsa and drove straight from Tulsa down to Sulphur. And uh, <clears throat> it was all by faith. That was our probably our most miraculous year of faith because we launched out no promise of anything. Really, all we had was hope uh, and faith in God. That was it. And we launched out, didn't know where we were going. I just knew we were supposed to head this way, and um, that whole year was just really an amazing year. Uh, so we had a great time. Our memories of sulfur have always been really good, and so we look forward to creating some new good memories here. Amen? So, well, a couple of things I want to cover with you tonight. We will, um, since this is a rather unusual, slightly unusual setup uh, of starting on a Sunday evening like this, we want to... Uh, get some of the, I was going to get some of the preliminaries out of the way. How many of you are going to be here tomorrow? Okay, most of you, good deal. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm saying this is because what I want to do tonight, even though this is the DHT, the Divine Healing Technician Training, most of you are here either to receive healing or to learn how to minister healing, and that's what we're going to do. But I really feel that tonight I need to start with, and actually what we're going to do is probably, I say this, we're, we're guessing at this point, we're going to try to do this in two sessions. We're going to go about an hour, maybe 45, 55 minutes, and then take a few minutes break and then come back and do another roughly about a 45 minute session. And so in doing that, that'll give me an opportunity to minister two separate things to you. These are what I consider probably the two most important messages that we can deliver. Uh, we've done it all over the world, and if you get this, these two messages and you see it, then everything else will just naturally flow out of that, and everything will start to come together for you. And so I really hope that you would uh, take notes. Uh, we probably won't be using the manual tonight directly, but if you do have a manual, I would suggest you go in and look at all the, um, all the preliminary in the manual, <clears throat> because the preliminary is there. Uh, if we can get those out of the way, then we can also move on faster the rest of the week. And so the, the preliminaries that I'm talking about would be starting, if I can find this here, yep. Uh, you can see in your manual pages one through four, it's just the contents, page five, endorsements, that's some of the nice things that people said about us. Uh, page six, <clears throat> it's where I usually ask people, who have attended a DHT before? How many see your hands? How many of you have been to a DHT or heard it online? You've heard it, okay, somewhere, okay. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you are sick and you need healing? That's why you're here. You came to get healed. Okay, all right, good deal. How many of you are not sick, you don't need healing, but you came because you want to learn to minister healing? We see your hands. Good, all right, well then that's, you got the right heart because it's never enough to go just to get. You need to go and get so you can give it away. That's the key. Now, one of the main things to remember is that uh, you'll see about halfway down the page in page six. I said I wasn't going to get in the manual. I am a little bit, obviously. But first off, you'll see the big, bold letters that Jesus never taught healing. Technically, he never taught it. Now, you can, we can glean a lot from what was said about healing. 
But he never said, okay, here's how you get healed. Here's how you do this. But yet we can watch what people did. We can see how he ministered. But there's a difference because you have to realize Jesus never dealt with a Christian. There were no Christians until after he was dead and resurrected. Amen? So no matter what we read in the Gospels, and it's all good, and you can get healed by doing what it shows there, and we'll talk about that. But technically, you cannot connect yourself to the people in the Gospels, because you're not them. They were not born again. Matter of fact, the way I usually tell people is this. <clears throat> there's in every healing in the New Testament, or at least in the Gospels, there's usually three people involved, three or four, okay? The first one is a sick person. Now, the second one is usually Jesus. The third people you see there are usually the disciples. And then the fourth people you usually see there are usually the Pharisees. Now, Almost everybody will identify with one of those four groups. Well, automatically, we don't want to identify with the Pharisees. Can we all agree with that? All right? So we want to knock that out. Now, but the thing is, you, number one, if you're a Christian now, you shouldn't identify with the sick because that's not who you are. Even though your body may be sick, that's not who you are. Jesus didn't consider you the sick. You shouldn't even identify yourself with the disciples because they didn't have what you have. All they had at that time was the Spirit with them, but the Spirit was not in them. And, Jesus, and they were not recreated. They were not born again. And Jesus said, there's a lot of stuff I want to share with you, but you can't bear it right now. Why? Because he said the carnally minded in 1 Corinthians, he said the carnal minded cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Amen? So, so you, do, you can't identify with the Pharisees, can't identify, hopefully you don't, can't identify with the disciples, can't identify with the sick person. That only leaves one person for you to identify with, Jesus. Why? Because you've been recreated, remade into the, his likeness and image. So whatever you see him do in the Gospels, that should be you seeing yourself do that. And so I'm going to show you why that's true tonight, and we're going to try to get there. I'll try to get it all done. But he never taught healing. He, he came and he taught the gospel of the kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom of God. And if you take those words, sometimes we hear things so much that, and we've heard different definitions, that many times you don't even know really what it's talking about, but you kind of have an idea, but it's your own idea or an idea that somebody gave you. So when it says that he preached, okay, let's just start with preaching. First off, the Apostle Paul said, I have fully preached the gospel all through this area. And he said, with signs and wonders. Isn't that right? So you've not fully preached the gospel until there are signs and wonders. Secondly, he said, when you read the word preach, the word preach, especially the way that it tells us to preach the word in Timothy, it says, preach the word, be instant, in season and out of season. Isn't that right? And that word preach is a particular word that literally means to proclaim. Now, the closest we have to it is Jesus in Luke chapter 4. He said he had been, that he was anointed by God, right? And the Spirit of the Lord was upon him because he was anointed to do what? At one point, he said to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now, if you'll notice, every time Jesus ministered healing, that's what he did. He proclaimed liberty to the captive. He didn't offer liberty. He didn't say, if you want it, come get it. He just proclaimed it. If you'll notice the woman with the, with the, um, that was bowed over, it said that he was preaching in the synagogue, and she, a woman came in that was bowed over for 18 years and could in no wise lift herself up. So here she is bowed over, couldn't see anybody, anything but anybody's feet for 18 years. She walks in, and it says, when Jesus saw her, not when he heard the voice of the Spirit say, heal that woman. Not when he said, and the Spirit led him to heal. Now, it doesn't say that. Now, we know he was always led by the Spirit, but it was not a special thing of God pointing her out and saying, fix her. It was just the general idea. He saw a problem, he fixed it. That's what I hope you get this week, that wherever you see a problem, you fix it, right? And as it is in heaven, so should it be on earth. So how do you know who to fix and who not to? Well, if they don't look like they will in heaven... Fix them till they look like they would look in heaven. It's really just that simple. If you look around in heaven, you're not going to find crutches, not going to find wheelchairs, not going to find people with 
tubes, you know, sticking out of them or machines and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because that's not the way it is in heaven. And if God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven, it won't be that way here. Amen? So pretty much whatever it is, if it doesn't look like it would look in heaven, just fix it till it does, right? Now that word proclaim or to preach, let's go back to that. Because in Timothy, it even, he even tells me, he says, preach the word. And literally the Greek word there is an amazing word because the word preach literally means to proclaim with an authority, a solemnity, and a gravity that it must be listened to and obeyed. Now think about that. In other words, you haven't preached the gospel until you have preached the truth of the word of God in a way that is so has so much gravity, authority, solemnity, right? Meaning very solemn, very sober-minded, not, not just an emotional hype, but one that says, my God, I have to change. When you've heard that, you've heard the gospel, right? And the problem is you don't hear that a lot anymore. You hear people offering things, you hear motivational speeches, you hear all kinds of things, but you don't hear the gospel proclaimed in a way that makes you stop and think, I've got to change my life. Right? Now, the problem is, most people, when they hear that, they got two responses. I'm going to change, or I'm not going to change. If they're not going to change, then, well, let me start with if they are going to change. Let's start with the positive first. If they hear it and they said, you know what, I'm going to change, then what happened was when the word was preached, they were convicted, and they changed. Now, when you're convicted and you change, that comes from the conviction of the Holy Spirit bearing witness to the word that was preached. But if you hear the word and you are convicted by the word, by the Holy Spirit, with his uh, bearing on the word, you might say, but you decide not to change, that conviction changes and becomes condemnation. See, I've had people tell me before, well, you, you just preach me under condemnation. No, I preach the word. You decide if it's conviction or condemnation. You decide that, right? So he said we are to proclaim. Now, what he did, and you'll see this, matter of fact, through, throughout the teaching, that when he said to proclaim the word, proclaim the word of God with the gravity, authority, and solemnity that it must be listened to and obeyed. Jesus said, I've, I was sent. He said, I'm anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because I've been anointed to do what? To proclaim liberty to the captive. So when he saw the woman that was bowed over, he didn't offer anything. It, the Bible just clearly says he called her to him. It said when he saw her, he called her to him and said, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Now notice, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, Woman, how much faith do you have? Let's see if you have enough faith to get this off of you. He didn't say, Woman, uh, do you think I'm anointed? Woman, do you think I can do this? Now there were times he actually did ask people, Do you think I can do this? So I'm not saying it's wrong to think that, but I'm just saying, notice, and, and here's what a lot of people miss. They will take one incident. Okay, let, let's, let's take two different camps, you might say, of healing, because there's a bunch of them. There are some camps that will tell you, uh, before you can get healed, you've got to go back into your past, you've got every sin, get rid of every sin, make sure there's nothing there at all, and you've got to break these things and break them off and find them and you know, somehow break them before you can get free and before you can get healed. Right now, and there are people that that's how they what they teach, and they get some results. Some here's the thing: if they say you have to do that, then if I come along, don't ask any of those things, and get somebody healed, then that proves you don't have to do that. Amen. And so I actually had this happen when I was on Sid Roth, and I was there with some other people. And some were teaching different things, and one of them didn't like the fact that I said that we ought to walk in authority and do what Jesus did. And so they came to my room later and started asking me questions and trying to convince me that their way of doing it was right, but I wouldn't budge off the Word of God. And so finally they said, well, you know, but I, I get good results. I said, then good. Then why are you here? Why are you in my room? Just go get your good results. If that's you, I'm not, I'm not doing anything to you. Why did you come to my room? Right? If it's working for you, God bless you. Problem is, it ain't working for everybody. And so this man looked at me and said, well, the problem is, I got this back problem. <laughs> and I said, 
Well, did you, I, what I wanted, what I said in my head was, well, did you go through it and pull out all the sin? Have you examined yourself? That's what I wanted to say to him, because that's, I, I'm just thinking that's what he put everybody else through, right? But I was nice. And instead, I just said, all right, if what you're saying is true, I shouldn't be able to help you. But if what I'm saying is true, I should be able to set you free right now. Amen. And he said, yeah. I said, all right. Put my hand on his back, commanded his back to be healed. I said, now do what you couldn't do before. And he bent over and touched his toes. And when he came up, he was smiling. And he said, how'd you do that? And I just spent two hours <laughs> telling him exactly how I did it. Now, so I told him, I said, authority, dominion through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so when Jesus, what he taught, what the Bible says, he came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. The word kingdom, many times we think of a place, we think of a, a land, we think of something. And the word kingdom simply means the, the supremacy of God, if it's the kingdom of God. The word kingdom simply means somewhere where a king reigns supreme and has absolute authority. That's what it means. So Jesus came preaching, proclaiming, not offering, but proclaiming, right, the superiority of God of what? Over sickness, disease, sin, everything. He was proclaiming the superiority of God. That's what he preached. And then he demonstrated it by setting the sick free. Amen? Amen? So, now, so he did, what he taught was uh, really <clears throat> kingdom authority. And what he really taught was relationship with God. And that out of that relationship, the same authority should flow. Now, I will tell you this. If you, especially if you're a Christian, most Christians have a real problem in that they think everybody else's relationship with God is better than theirs. It's just like prayer. If you ask anybody, do you pray enough? Nobody ever says, oh, yeah, I pray more than enough. No, no. I've never heard that. All the times I've ever asked it, they always say, well, you know, I could pray more. Well, probably not. I mean, it's just, you know, I'm like, well, do, you, do you or do you not? I mean, how, how do you feel about it? How do you think God feels about it, right? And so it's amazing because if you start talking about these things, people will automatically, you know, if I, if I came here in here and I said, all right, tonight we're going to have healing service. And everybody, yay, okay, good. Okay, now, uh, and, and this is what God told me. Everybody here tonight is going to get healed except one person. And everybody would say, they're going, that's probably me. That's probably <laughs> me. No, you should be going, boy, I sure pity that poor person, but bless God, I'm getting mine. I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting mine. So I don't know who that is, but I'm, I'm going to get mine. Amen? That's what we should be thinking. Why? Because he died to give us this. If he died to give it to us, we ought to be first in line to get it. Amen? It's not greedy to take all that God has offered. Right? It's actually false humility not to take it. Right? So, all right, keep going. Notice here, uh, at the very bottom, Galatians 6, 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. It's this new creature. Now, what you're going to learn this week is you're going to learn what the Bible says about healing. And in that, you're going to find out that because you're a new creature, it works better. If you're not a new creature, you can preach healing and people will get healed. Why? Because the word works. And if they believe the word, they'll get healed. Even if the person preaching it doesn't believe it. But if the person preaching it believes it and has a relationship with God. Now, it's not, and uh, you know, contrary to what a lot of people think, God is not measuring your relationship with him and waiting till you get to a certain point before he heals you or before he uses you to heal somebody else. The minute you get born again, the life of the vine flows through the branch. He's the vine, we're the branches. Amen? Amen. And so it's not a matter of, well, if you get close enough, then this will happen. If you, get, if you draw in close to God strong enough, if you press in enough, all these things that nobody can measure, but you're always told what to do, and yet you never know if you're doing it right or not, because they can't tell you how much of it to do. So the real key is just realizing that once you're connected, that same life flows. You know, we have plugs all around the wall here. And the electric company does not care if we plug in lights, cameras, blow dryers, 
they, they, they could care less. Matter of fact, to be honest with you, they love it. The, the bigger the device you plug into it. Isn't that right? God's the same way. He doesn't care whether you're believing for a stub toe or a headache, a migraine headache or cancer or HIV or coronavirus or anything else. <laughs> I'm trying to stay away from that because I'm trying to stay away from because I got some very um, strong beliefs about these things, all right? We have, uh, well, we have just things that I believe God has showed me about it that I don't want to get into this week, but uh, I'll tell you how to beat it, okay, and tell you how to live free of it, and we'll stay away from how and why it was created and who's doing it and all that kind of stuff. I will try. So anyway, <laughs> now, <laughs> so, <clears throat> but, but there's really only two things you really need to know about healing. They're right there on page seven. Number one, is healing always God's will? And number two, did God command believers to heal the sick? Yes. So really, if those two things are yes, and you just said they are, then really, there's nothing left to do but get after it. Now, the Bible's clear. Now, and I actually have it written here for you. If you remove past experiences and other teachings, you might say, that negates the scriptures, there would be no more hesitation or doubt about healing and deliverance than there is about salvation. See, the only reason you're so solid on salvation is because you've had it preached to you, preached to you, preached to you. Even before you received it, you had it preached to you. It's drilled into you that you can come to Jesus at any point and he will receive you. If that same viewpoint had been drilled into you about healing, we wouldn't even be here tonight. It's just that simple. Because you have to remember whenever Jesus preached, and this is one of the things that stands out, is how opposite the church is. How backwards is what I usually call it. But if you look at Jesus' day, it was funny because they really didn't have any problem with him healing unless he did it on the wrong day. If he happened to do it on the wrong day, it was a big problem. But healing, they never questioned that he could heal. They got <laughs> upset when he started forgiving sins. When he started saying, your sins are forgiven you, that's what got them set on fire. right? And now notice, isn't it amazing today we can talk about forgiveness of sins all day long. Nobody says anything. But you mention healing, and all of a sudden, oh, but that stopped with the apostles. That stopped in, in the apostolic age. I got news for you. This is the apostolic age. This is still the same time, right? Only two covenants, and we're in the new one. And that started with Jesus, and it's still going, right? And you can, we can prove, and you know, we, we'll show you as we go along, but the whole key to this is just simply realizing that we have been trained wrong over the years. And it's usually because our theology has not been based on Bible, but on failure. Every time we would pray for somebody and it didn't work, we had to come up with a reason why it didn't work. And then that reason becomes the gospel to us. And we started adding reasons why people should fail to receive. Now, there's only two reasons for failure, and Jesus only gave two reasons. And the two reasons are real simple. <clears throat> Number one, he said, because of your unbelief. We'll talk about that specific scripture a little bit later on. But that's the number one reason, the first reason he gave, was because of your unbelief. So now, how many of you are believers? Okay, how many of you are unbelievers? Okay, so unbelief shouldn't be your problem. If you're a believer, I mean, what, what sense is there in being an unbelieving believer? I mean, that's oxymoron, isn't it? I mean, so, so we shouldn't be that. Now, however, because, now, and this is the second reason, Jesus said, by your traditions, you make the word of God of none effect. That's the main reason why we have the problems in healing that we do today. is because we have built up these traditions. We usually call them sacred cows. But there are these traditions that we have built up that are contrary to the word of God, but we believe they are the word of God. And because of that, our traditions make the word of God of none effect. So my job over the next couple of days is real simple. It's just to take all of those sacred cows, those traditions that we built up, and kill them all, and just remove them. Because when you remove the traditions that make the Word of God of none effect, all that's left is the Word of God, and it works. Isn't that right? Yeah. So it's really simple. It's just we have to point those things out. So that's what we're going to do. Now, page 9, <clears throat> uh, actually page 8, gives you the answer to the first two, basically, that I... The questions I asked just a minute ago. But on page 9 gives you some basic information about the ministry. 
And I want to tell you, I, I, I may be talking a little bit of history here. Probably won't do it tonight. Maybe I'm going to try to stay away from it tonight. And I don't want to get too far into it because this isn't a history lesson. If I share some history, there's a point to it. There's a principle that I want you to get, right? Um, but the main thing is that, first and foremost, I am not here in the name of John G. Lake, right? I may be over general overseer of the ministry, uh, but I'm not here in his name. He didn't hang on a cross for me. He wasn't whipped at a whipping post for me. Uh, he didn't, you know, come out of the grave for me. So I'm not here in his name. I'm here in the name of Jesus. Amen? And I represent him, and I will speak for him. Now, to be a representative of someone, you can only say what they would say. If you say something other than what they would say, at that point, you cease being a representative of that person. That makes sense? So what I have to do is I just simply have to say what he has said to make sure that I'm a representative accurately of what he has said, and that makes me a good representative of him. Amen? Now, what that means is this. <clears throat> if I am here as a representative of Jesus, as a representative of God. Now, see, if you even from the physical, how we're facing each other, okay? You're facing this way, I'm facing that way. Now, let's say for a minute, you're looking toward God, not at me, obviously, but toward God past me. Now, that means that I, I'm, uh, my job is to come from God and to speak for him to you. Amen? Now, if I was to speak to him, okay, for you. Now, think about that. Okay, I'm either going to speak for him to you, or I'm going to speak for you to him. That's the only two positions. Can we agree with that? So, I have to decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to speak for him and to you, or am I going to speak to him for you? Well, my job as his representative is to come to you and speak to you for him. That means I can only say what he has said. That means that if I talk like a man, I mean, whose representative am I? I'm supposed to be God's. The Bible says, if a man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God, right? So if I'm going to come to you, then I can only say what he said. So the minute I start sounding like a man, I have stopped being a representative of God. Does that make sense? What that means is, because remember what they said about Jesus? No man ever spoke like this before. Right? So why? Because he spoke like God to the people. And so our job is to represent God and to speak for him. So I have to say what he has said, and I can't just talk like a man and make excuses. God never made excuses. Amen? Yes. And I will say it is good to have a gospel that works. Amen. It's good to have a gospel that you don't have to make excuses for. Amen? Amen. Because I, I had another kind of gospel at one time. And I had to learn all the excuses. And usually you have to go to church to learn those, or you have to go to Bible school uh, to learn those excuses and get them down, right? But thank God I found the truth. And we'll talk about why here shortly. Now, the, um, this tells you a little bit about the ministry. Notice on page 11, it has an important notice. And you can fill that out. Page 12, important notice number 2. Number 3 on page 13. Four on, four, uh, 4 on 14 and 5 on 15. So just read through those between now and tomorrow sometime, and then we will collect those from you if you don't mind. And so <clears throat> now if you look on page 18, it gives you the two reasons for failure that I just talked about, unbelief and traditions of man. Right? Now look at the bottom, and it says the only hindrance to healing is that you believe there are hindrances to healing. Now, the minute you stop believing that there are hindrances to healing, your success rate is going to shoot through the roof. It's just that simple. Why? Because whatever you make as a, whatever begins as a, uh, how would we say it, um, as an exemption, right? It, all of a sudden, it becomes the rule. As soon as you believe, let's say, as soon as you say something like, well, you know, if there's sin in your life, God won't heal you. Well, as soon as you say that, then guess what? Forget getting healed, right? Uh, because automatically, now that'll become the rule rather than the exception. So, and that's the way it works through all these things. Now, it's amazing because if you go back and look at who Jesus healed, number one, the people in Jesus' time, they were not born again, so they were not considered righteous. They, they were not new creations. Is that right? So if you're not a new creation, you're a old creation, Right? 
Okay? And if you're an old creation, now see, the new creation is recreated in righteousness and true holiness after the image of him that recreated him, right? And so when you're born again, you're recreated in Christ and you're made righteous in him. Now, at that point, you're not just made, well, we become the righteousness of God in Christ, the Bible says. Is that right? So if we become the righteousness of God in Christ, now we are, be, well, we're told that we are righteous. But before you're born again, I'm not talking about religious duties or activities or anything like that, but before you're born again, I don't care how good you are, you're still sin. You don't just sin in action, your nature is sin. Do you get that? That's why your spirit, your nature has to be recreated to be changed from sin to righteousness. See, because, uh, well, because of sin in the sinner, the sinner sins. Amen? Even if a sinner was pretty good, okay, and didn't do things, their nature is still sin. Well, the Christian's nature is righteousness. So the people Jesus dealt with were not righteous. Now, they did all they could to live righteous, but that righteousness, which was of the law, did not get them born again. Amen? But notice the righteousness of the law is not considered righteousness because they were still sinners and still were the essence of sin in, in their nature. So everybody Jesus healed. I right, make the long story short as much as I can. Everybody that Jesus healed were sinners, and they didn't just sin. They were sin in their nature. So if you said, well, I'm sorry, there's too much sin in you. I can't heal you. Did Jesus ever say that? No. And as a matter of fact, he couldn't say that because they couldn't get the sin out. Is that right? They could do what they, what they could do to try to live according to the law, but even if they did, they would still in their nature be sin. So if the sin is there in their nature, they could never get all the sin out. So every person Jesus healed were sinners. So the idea of sin being in a person, stopping the power of God, cannot be true. Amen? As a matter of fact, it's usually used, according to Mark 16, as a sign for sinners to turn to God whenever God healed them through means of laying on of hands or something along those lines. Amen? Amen? So we have to start knocking these traditions out. Now, but I want to show you, uh, I'm going to move ahead here quickly. I want you to read these, preferably uh, between now and tomorrow. Page 19, what the Bible says about divine healing. And this is just makes it simple. We break it down and we give you these nine points. And if you kind of internalize these nine points, it'll really help you uh, get see things and it'll, it'll change how you see people so that you don't see them as, well, I wonder what they did to get that. Well, I wonder what they did wrong to do. I wonder, you won't even think that way. You just, what you start to see is, remember what Jesus said? He said he was sent to proclaim liberty to the captive, right? And if, when you start to realize who you are in Christ and who he is in you and God's real view of healing and health and these kind of things, when you see that, you start to look at people as, prisoners of war. You start to look at them as captives of the enemy that you're to set free. You don't think in terms of, well, what did they do? Why do they have this? Because then you start thinking, well, they probably deserve it. And say, well, you know, they're, they're, you know they, I'm sure they did something wrong. But it's sad because then we start looking at them and we, instead of being deliverers, we become judges. And we're not called to be judges. We're called to be deliverers. Amen? So we're going to look at some more of these things that go on, but please read these through. Now, uh, and then page 20, this is just, I put this in a manual uh, because these are the principles that we operate by so everybody would know and anybody that works with us, this is how they operate. So it's pretty easy real quick to see if somebody has veered off the path. And so you'll see, um, it gives you a good idea of it. Now, but I want to get to the main thing tonight. I want to take you, there we go, to, we're going to go through scripture and we're going to go quickly. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> We're going to look at, and what I want you to do, if you get this, I'm, 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 I'll be honest with you. This is a little different than what I'm used to doing, but I really believe that the Lord has shown me that if we do this first, the rest of this you will grab hold of quicker, and it will function quicker in you. How many, how many are ready for that? 
you want it to function quicker, amen? All right, because that's, see, that's what I, when I, when I drive, I drive for hours at a time, riding, praying, talking to God, meditating on things, uh, all these different things. And when I do that, my goal is I'm always thinking, God, how can I get this into the people faster so it works faster and it works better and they can get it and they can run with it? Because I don't believe it's God's will for you to have to meditate or confess the scriptures for 30 years before it works for you. I believe God wants you functional and effective as quickly as possible, and that's my goal. And so I'm constantly open to him to show me better ways to get it across. So I hate to admit it, but you're my guinea pigs tonight, right? Uh, so we're going to, and, and we'll see where we go tomorrow, and we'll just launch normal tomorrow. But I'll, if you get this, maybe some of you can't come back tomorrow. If you don't, if you get this, everything I'm teaching the rest of the days, it'll function in you. You'll see it right? Because there are certain things. I was blessed to spend time with Dr. Lester Summerall. You know, I read John Lake's letters and his sermons. And we'll, I'm not going to go too far into the history of it, but uh, I, I had a need, and when I recognized my need, I saw, I started looking for healing, and I knew God could heal. I knew he healed me as a child, but at the same time, I was always looking for, okay, how do you get him to do it? You know, I knew he could, just wasn't sure how to get him to do it, especially not consistently. And so I started heard about this name, this guy named John Lake, and I knew he knew what he was talking about because not only did he do it, but the people he trained did it. And if you can do it, that could be a gift. But if you can train people to do it, that's the Word of God. And so that's what I started looking at. But as I read his letters, I saw certain, I'll say letters, there were letters and things that really impacted me. But his sermons, and as I read even the sermons, I mean, obviously he had been dead since 1935, so I couldn't hear him. But as I read them, I could see the truth in it, but the, the underlying theme in everything he did was really authority or dominion over and over again, a dominion over sickness and disease and demons and, you know, just all the elements of life, basically. And I saw that, but I didn't know how to, to walk in it. And then God amazingly, allowed me to go to South Bend, Indiana and spend time with Dr. Lester Summerall. And while I was there, I saw a man who walked in dominion the way John Lake talked about it, but not really so much focusing on healing, but more along the lines of deliverance and things like that. So what I saw in, in Dr. Summerall was this man of how, how, what dominion does whenever you get it. When you start to understand dominion and authority, I saw how it affects you. And so I was watching him, and I imitated him, and I listened to him, and I asked questions and all this. And then I started seeing the words of John Lake's sermons through Dr. Sumrall and thought, wow, this is how, if John Lake were alive today, this would be his mannerisms, this would be his demeanor, and yet it would be along these lines, especially in healing. And Dr. Sumrall saw some tremendous healings, don't, don't get me wrong, but it was, a, it was just a little different. So as I started studying this and started putting it into practice, and I'll, I'll maybe give you the process later. But the whole point was, and, and the reason, I'm, if I tell you history, the point is this. Most people think of John Lake as this man that was highly anointed of God, meaning, in their mind, he was walking down the street one day, and God looked over the balcony of heaven, I've actually heard somebody describe it this way, and saw John Lake and said, there's John Lake. I'm going to anoint him with healing power, and just dumped it on him. And he was just walking along, and all of a sudden, now here he's got this healing power, and he was just destined for miracles. And they said the same thing about Smith Wigglesworth, and they said the same thing about everybody that's ever done anything. But then I started looking at John Lake's life, and I realized he didn't start out that way. He started out as one in a family of 16 brothers and sisters, and before he was 21 years old, eight of them had died of sickness or disease. Now, when that happens to eight of your siblings you learn to develop a hatred for sickness and disease, right? And that was the one thing God was looking for in a person. He said, I want to find somebody that hates sickness and disease, somebody that wants the answers and will go after the answers, and I will reveal it to them, right? And that's what he did, and he saw that in a man named John Alexander Dowie, and he had five brothers and sisters that were also dying, not, in, not out of the eight. Five out of the eight that were still living were also dying. And they went to John Alexander Dowie's church in Chicago, 
a few hours away from where John Lake lived. And when they went there, they all came home healed. So John Lake said, I'm going there. I'm going to go there. But he, now he didn't need healing right at that time. But he said, I'm going to move to Zion is where they were at near uh, Chicago. So I'm going to move to Zion so that I can study divine healing so that I can practice it and teach it. And that's what he did. So it wasn't just some special anointing like people talk about the John Lake mantle, the John Lake anointing. John Lake didn't have a John Lake anointing, right? There is no named anointing, right? It is just Jesus living through a person. And I will tell you, every time you mention the anointing as though it were some special thing, gifted or added to, you are stealing the glory from Jesus because you're putting that glory on a man. And the idea is to realize that every one of these people were simply men and women that decided to trust God's word, to take him at his word and do what it says. And whenever they did, it worked. Amen? Amen. So now, take your Bibles, and we're going to run here. We're probably going to run a little bit over, so we're good. All right. Go with me to Genesis. I'm going to get my Bible out of there. There we go. So we're going to go very quickly, but I want you to get this tonight because, like I said, if you do, I guarantee you this will change your life. I, I wish I had started with this I, in, in, in my Christian walk. I wish I had known this. Um, if I had only one message, one chance to talk to a person for an hour, maybe, or less, and they said, what's the one thing, what's the most important thing you could give me? And I already knew they were born again. Maybe I already knew they were baptized in the Spirit, that kind of thing. This would be what I would tell them. This would be it. So, in Genesis chapter 1, starting in chapter 1, in verse 20, we'll start in verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Notice, let man have dominion over the earth and everything on it, everything that flew, everything that crawled, everything that swam, everything. Is that right? Is that what it says? All right. So, now just, again, I'm going to kind of go back and forth here. <clears throat> that means that originally God's plan for man, I, I know... If I had to come in and just ask most people, okay, what, what is your purpose on this earth? What is our purpose here? Most people have been pre-programmed to say to know God and to make him known. Or uh, we are here to worship God. That's We're here to worship and glorify God. Okay, those are all true answers. But they're not the truest answer. The truest answer to your purpose on this earth would be God's original purpose for man which is for man to have dominion over all the earth. It's the first commandment that he gave. Is that right? When he created, he said, let us make man. So when he made man, in his mind, the purpose of his making man was so that man would have dominion. You got that? He does not say so that man will praise me, so that man will worship me. Should you do those things? Absolutely. And believe it or not, if you learn what I'm telling you tonight, you will worship and praise him at a whole nother level, right? at a whole nother degree because you realize how truly good he is to where he put you in a position that is amazing and you didn't even have to work for it. Amen? Amen. And you start to understand what real grace is. Amen. Right? Yes. So, then he says <clears throat> in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. You notice there it says, uh, let me go back to verse 27. In the middle, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. You notice it doesn't say male and female and undecided. <laughs> just going to throw that in there. It's just something to think about. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And, and verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, at the time he said that, there was only two people here. Right? So, the one thing you'll never see here is where God said have dominion over other people. 
He never said have dominion over other people. Matter of fact, every war that's ever been started was started because somebody took, was, was trying to um, you know, pervert this idea of dominion. See, in every human there is birth. In every human living, born again, not born again, doesn't matter. Every human has in them technically a spirit of dominion. It's in them to have dominion. Why? Because man was created for dominion, and it's in them. Unfortunately, whenever it is perverted, instead of having dominion over the earth and serving mankind, instead they turn it to where they want dominion over mankind. And when they do that, now they've moved out of the realm of what God intended because the idea has been perverted. All right? Now, notice here, <clears throat> too, that he said, let them have dominion over everything that crawls, everything that moves upon the earth. Do you know that viruses crawl, they swim, right, and they fly? So we have dominion over them. Do you understand that? Right? I have a testimony I got this morning, right? Hadn't really told anybody else yet, but it's uh, from a person that is connected to us. Uh, they were connected through a church out of Malaysia that it was connected to a pastor and an intercessor in Hong Kong. And I can't give the name because the underground church and the stuff. But there in Wuhan province, there was an entire community that was locked down under quarantine because every person, they're talking about a person, when they say community, they meant in their church community. Every person had been diagnosed as uh, infected with coronavirus. So everything's locked down. So this one pastor began praying, began praying as the way that I'm teaching you this week. And now every person, as of this morning, every person in that community is no longer infected. They've all been healed. And apparently locally, the Chinese government have taken notice and has started, because as they tested their blood, they realized, that, and now they've started asking that church for blood donations because they say now there's healing power in the blood that they're giving the people. Amen. Amen. Now, that, that's the power of the blood of Jesus flowing through the, the, the branches. Amen. And so I'm following up on this. If we get more details, I'll share more of it different ways. But um, this, this was, the, I just received this this morning. So again, anytime the enemy is trying to do something this massive, just watch for God. He's going to do some things that are going to draw attention, things that can't be ignored. See, a lot of things, we do something in a, in a building, uh, you know, if every person here had HIV and they all got healed, somehow the media would ignore it. But when it's already out there in the media and these things start happening, you can't ignore it. It will come to light. Amen? Yes. So now... So we were created, man was created to have dominion over all the earth. You got that? Now, go with me, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to Psalm 115. Psalm 115. <coughs> now, if it's in the Bible, will you believe it? Okay, let's read it and see. Psalm 115. And we're going to look about verse 13. Verse 13 says, He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. You hear that? The God made heaven and earth. Notice he said then, he said the Lord, uh, the, the earth, the, the heavens are the Lord's. Isn't that right? But, it, but now, notice first off, he says God has made the heavens and the earth. Then he differentiates. And he says now the heaven, that belongs to him. But the earth he has given to the children of men. Right? So now you've got heaven and earth. Heaven is God's. Earth is man's. You got that? Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have anything to do with the earth, but now he has put somebody over the earth to subdue it, Adam, right? The first Adam. Now, watch this. <clears throat> In verse 16, notice, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. So who owns the earth? We do, man, right? But now notice, God still wants 
input into the earth, but he no longer owns the earth in this sense. But now man has been put over it. This would show you why. Well, let's just move on here. I'll show you. The, go with me to 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians. If I can get there. There we go. 2 <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In other words, if it's not understood and, and they don't receive it, it's because they're lost and they don't understand the things of God. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now notice, notice what it says here. It says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of people that have not received the gospel. Now we know that, that that's not talking about the God of heaven and earth, right? Well, how do we know that? Well, two ways. Number one, it's a little g, not a big g, right? That's the first way. I know and that's just in English, but understand too that the way we also know this is because God has not blinded eyes, right? But he actually opens eyes. And he's trying to reveal the gospel. He's not trying to hide the gospel. Amen? <clears throat> so now we know that here Paul is talking about somebody other than God. And we know, if you read what he talks about here, we know that he's talking about Satan. So here he calls Satan the God of this world, right? Now notice, Satan wasn't created to be God of this world. But now watch this. Go with me now to Luke chapter 4. So we will see. This is super simple, easy to follow, right? Not hard. In Luke chapter 4, start in verse 1. <clears throat> and Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when, he, when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If you be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now just stop right there for a moment. <clears throat> Notice what he said here. The way the devil always attacks, it's always the same way. What do you say first? If you be the Son of God. Let's see. Notice his first attack was on Jesus' identity, trying to get him to doubt who he was. He said, if you're the son of God. Now, that's the same way he attacks you, people around you. You do something maybe that, you know, wasn't exactly right. Well, I thought you were a Christian. I can't believe you would do something like that. What is that? That's an attack on your identity. That's why he said, well, if you were a real Christian, you wouldn't talk like that. If you were a real Christian, you wouldn't do that. Now, I'm not excusing whatever it was, right? I'm just saying that's where the enemy attacks, right? Now, notice here also how Jesus responded. It is written. Now, if Jesus had to respond with it is written, you're probably going to have to respond with it is written. Amen? You can't go out of here saying, say, well, now, devil, let me tell you, you can't bother me because Brother Curry said. Now, that only works if Brother Curry said exactly what's written there. Amen? So why, why put me in the mix? Right? Don't throw me under the bus. I've got enough battles I'm fighting on my own. Right? But what you need to do is look at it and say, no, devil, let me, let me set you straight here. It is written. But to say it is written, you've got to know where it's written. That means you've got to get your nose in that book. Amen? Now, notice he says here, verse 5, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And can you imagine what that must have looked like? And the devil said unto him, All this power, authority, right, will I give you, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now, notice here, he's showing them all the kingdoms of the world. He's showing them all of this glory, all this power, all this authority. And he says, listen, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. And he said, because it was given to me, and I can give it to whoever I want. Think about this. This is, you know, I always hear these stories. <clears throat> I, I'm, I've never been a gambler as far as cards and, you know, dice or any of that kind of stuff. I've never, I've never even played cards or any of that stuff. I don't know anything about it. But I always hear these stories about these guys that will bet just huge amounts, you know. I mean, in, in one game, you know, one hand, I guess, 
they they would lose everything. I mean, I mean, I'm talking major things, and you know, you always hear about people, you know, throwing their car keys on a table and they're betting their car. Whatever. That's nothing to what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about massive fortunes being lost in in a moment, and yet that's exactly what Satan is doing here, is that he is offering everything. And think about that. And he says, and, but he says, this was all given to me. It was delivered to me. And I can give it to whoever I want to. I mean, it's like he has the deed to the earth. And he can just sign it over to whoever he wants to. It makes it seem so simple that he can give the whole earth away. And that's exactly what he's saying. Well, he said, it was delivered to me and I can give it away. Why? Because I received it and I can give it, right? When, when did the devil receive the earth? Eden. Isn't that right? What did he say to Eve? Remember what he said to Eve when he came to her? The first thing he said, did God say? You know, what, what, what was that about? Why would he say, did God say? See, Satan's attacks always come along and try to get you to doubt God's word. If he can get you to doubt God's word, he's beat you. And so he always comes along and says, did God really say that you can't touch this tree, you can't eat this tree, you can't, don't even look on it, and all the, I mean, all the stuff he said. It's amazing. The devil actually quoted God better than he did, if you go back and read it, because God didn't say all the things that she said. But here it says, at that moment, now think about this, because man was created, the earth was created for man, man was created to oversee the earth, so technically, if, if Satan was called the God of this world, and he is, and this is in uh, Corinthians, so this is still the same time period we live in, so he's still technically the God of this earth, the God of this world. <clears throat> if he was made that, that happened whenever Adam handed everything over to him. And notice he didn't say, Satan, I give you all of the earth. He didn't do that. He just obeyed him. What does that mean? Satan became God whenever Adam chose who he would make his God by obedience. That's just something to think about. That your God, whoever you serve, that's who you belong to. Isn't that right? And so we have to realize it's not just a matter of just saying something. The devil doesn't care what you call yourself. What he cares about is how you act, how you live, what is your life like, right? He could care less what you call yourself. So... Notice here, <clears throat> he says, <clears throat> all this power will I give to you. It was given to me, and I will give it to whomever I will. And again, it says, if thou will worship me, uh, all will be yours. And Jesus answered him and said, get behind me, Satan, <clears throat> for it is written, you will worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. Now, the whole key to this is this point. <clears throat> Say. Adam handed the world over to Satan. God gave the world to Adam. And God has, as we said before, the heavens belong to, to the Lord, but the earth belongs to the children of men. And then what happened was that Adam handed that over to Satan so that he became the God of this world. But now notice man still had dominion. And, God, and now Satan was trying to work his will through man's dominion on this earth. That's why the problem is people, mankind, started trying to exercise their dominion through the fallen nature, but it's still there. People look at, why did you climb that mountain? Because it was there. I had to conquer that mountain. I had, and they have in their idea, what, what did that mountain ever do to you? Why do you have to conquer it, right? But he says, I have to conquer this. Well, we've conquered the, the ocean. We've conquered space. We've con there is a spirit of dominion, the spirit of having to conquer in mankind as a whole, and he's born with it. Now, the, the good thing is, once he's born again, that should be shifted to where now he is accomplishing God's will on this earth and no longer Satan's will. But until he's born again, he's going to be accomplishing Satan's will. Now, you can see this again uh, when Jesus was dealing with Peter. He told uh, Peter, okay, uh, I've got to, well, he told all his disciples, he said, I'm going to have to go back to Jerusalem. Here's what's going to happen. They're going to take me. They're going to scourge me. They're going to kill me. And, all the, and, and Peter says, no, Lord, no. No, we're not going to let that happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Now, think about this. He said, get behind me, Satan. And he said, because, and then he tells him why he called him Satan. He said, because you don't savor, you don't relish the things of God, but of man. Now, notice, so Jesus called him Satan, but said, the reason I'm calling you Satan is because you think like a man. Why? Because fallen man's thoughts 
are the devil's thoughts. His way of thinking is the, is the devil's way of thinking. So you've only got, as we even heard this morning, there's really only two families on this earth, the children of God and the children of the devil. It's just that simple. We're not bad-mouthing people when we call them a child of the devil. We're just stating the fact that of what their DNA is. You, you understand? So we're not putting anybody down. We want them all to be uh, set free and healed and brought over into the kingdom of God. It's not, a, But the first thing you have to do is be able to diagnose something and say, here is the basic problem. Amen? Now, you do have to look at what is um, <clears throat> in the Bible. There are three different types of people that are generally talked about, and that is the Jews and the Gentiles and the church. Right? So those are the three kinds of people in these two families. Right? So, now, don't have time to go into that tonight, but we might get a chance over here. But now notice, go with me to Matthew 21. Now, the reason I'm bringing so many scriptures, because I try not to usually hit this many scriptures, but I want to show you the overall picture. Are you with me so far? What has happened? God made the earth, right? Gave it to man. And then he said that God is, a, is the, the, the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth belongs to the children of men. And then we can see all this. And now we go and find out how Satan got a hold of this world, how he became the God of this world. It was because Adam gave it over to him, right? Now look at Matthew 21. And we're going to look at verse 12. Start in verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Now, the main problem he had with that was that they were charging so much for these things that were supposed that they were required for the worship of God. And so they were charging them outrageous prices. You know, it's like buying food at the airport. Okay? <laughs> so, anything like that. Okay? So... Then it says in verse 14, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. They came to him, and he healed them. Notice, it didn't say he healed some. They came, he healed them. Anybody that came got healed, right? And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, so now we know that healing is wonderful. It's a good thing, right? Okay. And the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And they said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings you have perfected praise. And notice they got upset because they were, saying they, they were trying to say, Get the, these kids to stop that because that's only meant for the Messiah. They understood what that was from out of, the, out of the Psalms. And as a matter of fact, turn with me over to Psalm 8. <clears throat> this is where Jesus was quoting from when he said, Have you not read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? You have perfected praise. <clears throat> Notice Psalm 8. Verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Now, this is where Jesus was quoting. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have ordained strength. Now, notice Jesus said you have perfected praise. But he, as we, we would say, he misquoted it. But since he's the author and the word personified, I don't think we can say he misquoted it, right? But we do have to reconcile these two things because here he said, you have perfected praise. Here he says, you have ordained strength, which means if you take both of these together, that when you begin to praise God correctly, you are releasing the strength of God. All right, now watch, watch. He says, because of your enemies that you might steal the enemy, okay, and the avenger. Now, notice this. What he's telling him, notice that word, that you might steal, that you, that you can stop the enemy and steal the avenger. Now, notice, you can have an enemy and do nothing wrong. You can do everything right and have an enemy. Isn't that right? But now, notice, and here he says, because of your enemies, perfected praise, you begin to praise correctly according to what the Word of God says, because the Bible says we are to worship him, in spirit and in truth. So there is worship that God doesn't accept. God accepts worship in spirit and in truth. Okay? Let me throw this in there just so you're thinking about it. It does not say we must worship him in soul. Most, not most. Could be most. I don't know. I have not done an experiment to know the percentage. Okay? 
But I guarantee a lot of what people call worship is not in spirit, but in soul. And its purpose is to rouse up the soul and to excite the soul and not to exhibit the spirit and truth. Right? And it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight. So we're not going to take off on that. But, but notice he says, because of the enemy, that you, because of your enemy, that you might, now watch, what he actually says here is, that you might still stop the enemy and the avenger. Now see, an avenger, you can have an enemy and do nothing wrong, but if you have an avenger, that means you did something wrong, and they are to avenge. You get that? That's why they used to have these places in the, in the Bible, you read about them, called uh, cities of refuge. And if you killed somebody, then, you know, if you were contesting about why you did it, if you could get to that city of refuge, then that family, because back then when you killed somebody, the family came after you. But if you got into that city, they could not come into the city. As long as you stayed in the city, you were safe. Do you get that? Or he's kind of seeing the picture of what God was saying. So even if you did something technically wrong, you could get to a city of refuge and the avenger couldn't get to you. Okay? So you would have to tie that to God being our fortress. Amen? And so when you start to realize that, it says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. Now notice it says that through through perfected praise, through praise, accurate praise done in spirit and in truth, you have you, you ordained strength to release the spirit of God. So as you praise God correctly, then automatically you can stop the enemy and you can even stop the avenger from bringing, I'll just put it in common church terms. You don't always have to reap what you sowed. Amen? Now, I'm not saying, you know, try to do this, okay? Because it's not the way to live. But whenever you have messed up, how many of you know that it's good to know that you can turn to God and you don't always have to suffer all that was done or that you could, should have caused? Amen? Now, notice this is what Jesus was talking about. This was what he was quoting. Now, again, go with me to Hebrews. Hebrews, quickly. Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 1. <clears throat> he says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So if you've heard the truth of the Word of God, that's what he's talking about. If we've heard these things, we can't let them slip. I mean, I've been around church all my life. I've been serious about God <clears throat> really since I was 17. Got saved when I was nine, but 17, started walking with God and got more serious as I went along. <clears throat> I heard a lot of things early on. Now, some things, I'm glad they slipped because they weren't Bible. But the things that we've heard that are Bible, I've even, I recognize that at times some of those things start to slip because it's real easy to get focused on the here and now and you forgot sometimes what you heard last week. And every Sunday, we're used to coming to church and hearing a sermon, and, and we think it's here and now, and we forget that all of this, this Sunday, last Sunday, the Sunday before, all of that has to fit together. Why? Because he's trying to build into us the truth of the Word of God, and so it's not disjointed, it is all connected. Amen? And so, and that's one of the things that you can tell if you're hearing the Word of God. If you're hearing the Word of God, what you hear this Sunday won't contradict what you heard last Sunday. Amen? But try that sometime. You know, not here, because I know, Amen. I know, Brother Barrett, I know, all right? But I'm telling you, you go some places, you hear opposite messages from one Sunday to the next. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they don't understand the, the very basics of why we're here and what God has done, right? Now, he goes on, he says, Lest at any time we should let them slip, for if, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, a reward, in other words, Pretty much everybody, you know, if they let it slip, they got what they had coming. I'm just saying it common English. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? In other words, you've got to realize there are times you have to go back and go, okay, wait, where am I? 
Am I forgetting anything? Am I leaving anything out? Am I doing... I'm not talking about being overcritical and constantly analyzing yourself. I'm talking about you saying, okay, I just want to make sure I'm putting all the pieces together and I'm walking this out. And when you do that, it says, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness with both signs and wonders and with divers and miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not, now listen carefully, unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. So he didn't put the world to come under subjection to angels, right? But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? Now, watch this. He says, you made him, verse 7, a little lower than the angels. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, we're going to, matter of fact, just hold your place here. <clears throat> I should have told you to hold your other place too, but I didn't, sorry. But go back with me to Psalm. Psalm 8, right where we were just there a minute ago. Okay, yeah, go ahead and put Psalm 8. Eight, I'm, I'm, and two. eight and 2. Yeah, all the way through, actually. We're going to look at all of that. Yep. Oh, there we go. Psalm 8 and 2. There we go. All right, yeah. Out of, the mouth, out of the mouth of bays and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of your enemies, that you might steal the enemy and the avenger. Now to go to 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, verse 4, what is man? that thou art mindful of him. In other words, he, he, the psalmist is, and we see this in Hebrews, right? But the psalmist is simply saying, when I look at all you've created, the earth, the moon, the star, I, I look at all these amazing, huge things, and then I look at man. And I think, what is man compared to all of that? Why is it that you're so mindful? Why, why is man always on your mind, God? But that tells us right there, man is always on God's mind. All these other amazing works, the earth, the moon, the stars, the sun, all this stuff, but yet man is always on his mind. And then he says, and the son of man, that you visit him. So why, why, do, you visit, why do you even care about it? God, you're God, which means you're bigger than the things you create. And here you got this, let's just say what, how maybe Satan would look at us, and these puny humans whose Life is just a wisp, you know, most of them 60, 70, 80 years or something like that, just a short period of time in eternity. And, and I, I can imagine even Satan himself would be saying that to God. He'd be thinking, why, why do you care about these people? Look at them. They're puny humans. They're here one day, gone the next, you know, and, and why do you even care about them? And then he says, verse 5, for you have made him a little lower than the angels. And if you look in the original Hebrew, the word angel there is a, Greek, it's a Hebrew word, Elohim, which is a word used in Genesis for God. It's actually a plural term, right? That's why he said, let us make man in our image. And so he said that you made him a little lower than God. And, and the several other versions actually go on to even say for a short while, right? And he said, and has crowned him with glory and honor. Now watch this. Go to verse 6. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Now where is this from? This is Genesis. You, you gave him, no, even the same word, dominion. You gave him dominion over all the works of your hands. He is simply repeating Genesis 1, 26 to 28, right? And this is in Psalm Eight. Now, then he says, and you put all things under his feet. And this is, now, uh, originally, this would refer to man, but you have to also remember, Jesus was crucified from before the foundation of the world. Isn't that right? Yes. So he already knew all that was going to happen. He put it all into play. And even whatever he was saying, all of that through Adam, he was speaking to Christ. Do, do you get that? To man and to Christ, right? Which would come eventually, right? Now, Go with me to, let's see, we're at six. Yeah, look at verse seven. All sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field. Verse eight, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. 
Now notice this is exactly, again, what he is quoting over here in Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, he said, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. But now watch this. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Now we know that all of this was spoken to Christ, who was supposed to be, um, well, he is representative of all man, all right? And so what happened was, and God knew it was going to happen, God made man, man fell, passed the earth to Satan. Then he knew that Jesus was going to come and basically start a new race. That's what he did. He came to the earth and started a brand new race, and this new race would be of Christ. And so all of this, now he made man originally with all things under his feet, but now Christ comes along, and now he's talking about Christ at the same time, and he's saying this is what man was supposed to be all along. So Jesus came along, and if, now think about this. If Jesus had not had to die for us, then Adam's, that would have meant that Adam had not turned the world over to Satan. Isn't that right? And this is how man would live, in dominion. He wouldn't have had to toil the field and all that kind of stuff that he said, and he would have, would have had dominion over everything over the earth, and he would have exercised that dominion through words, right? And so just as he did uh, whenever he, God called the animals to come by and for Adam to name them, it was all done by words. The earth was formed, framed by words, isn't that right? So all of this is going on, and so this is how man was supposed to live. But now notice, he said, and he says in verse, uh, well, verse 8 there, you have put all things in subjection under his feet, man, Christ now, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Do you hear that? Nothing is not put under him. There's nothing that's not put under him. Amen? Amen. So everything is under his feet. Now, this sounds kind of like Matthew 28, doesn't it? All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto him. Isn't that right? So he says, but now we see not yet all things put under him. What does that mean? I mean? It sounds almost like a contradiction. Well, all things are under him, but yet we don't. But see, the key here is he says, but now we see, not yet. It doesn't mean they're not legally there. It just means we're not seeing it done yet. Do you get that? Now, when you start to, to realize this, I, I want you, well, I'm going to have to try to hurry here. But I want you to get this because this will change the way you function in everyday life, Right? I was getting, I was understanding authority over sickness and disease. I was understanding these things and starting to walk in these things and seeing them. But then I started seeing the overall picture and really what I'm teaching you here tonight. And when you get that, you start to realize we don't just have authority over sickness and disease. We've got authority over everything that touches our life and everything that touches anybody else's life. We have the authority to step in and fix it and make it right for them. You, do you get that? It, it, whenever, okay, I'm trying to jump back and forth. I'm really wanting to get into this. <clears throat> that's true. We do have, that's true. That is true. That's good. That's good. <clears throat> now, it said that through Abraham, that all the nations would be blessed. Is that right? Well, and it also tells us that if we are believers in Christ, then we are the true children of Abraham. Is that right? So if that's true, that all the nations, all the world is going to be blessed, and it's going to be blessed through Abraham, and now we are the seed of Abraham, then all nations has to be blessed through us as part of this world that we are to be a blessing to this world. Is that right? So then we are to start exercising that blessing to people and meeting those needs of people and start, well, I'll show you too, because he even talks about in Romans chapter 8, and I'll tie all these things together for you. But in Romans chapter 8, he even says that the whole earth groans waiting for the manifestation of the sons, plural, of God. What does that mean? That the whole world, right now the world is groaning. It was put under subjection. It didn't do it itself. It was done so by Adam. It didn't ask to be put under subjection to the God of this world. It was supposed to have been under Adam, but Adam gave it away. So now the earth is groaning, waiting for the new sons of God. You might, I hate to use that term that way, but it's waiting now for us to start to step up and act like sons of God. And when we do, the earth will be relieved of its curse in that sense, that it won't have to suffer some of the things that is going on even right now. And I can tell you, just like what we're seeing all over the world, we're seeing people that get a hold of this, start to walk in it, everything changes in their life. 
all of a sudden, you know, it's like people say, well, you know, well, how you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. Well, what are you doing under the circumstances? You're supposed to be above the circumstances. Amen? Circumstances have to, have to bow their knee to you, not you to it. Right? Now watch, because there's all kinds of scriptures that we're, we'll be bringing out, uh, hopefully tonight. We'll probably get them done. But he says in, um, I want to go to uh, verse, yeah, verse 9, Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus. We don't see everything yet under his feet, but we see Jesus, right? Who was made a little lower than the angels, a little lower than God, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory, <coughs> excuse me, and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, for it became him for whom are all things, right? In other words, it was right, it was good for him. Now watch, for whom are all things and by whom are all things and by whom are all things, says, in bringing many sons unto glory, many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, <clears throat> over and over, I want to get on over here. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and stop right then because we could go on into it, but I'll, I'll, I'm trying to get you to just to see what Jesus did was he came along and has restored that dominion now under God for everyone who is in Christ. So now we are back in that position that was we were supposed to originally be operating in. Do you get that? Because now we're in a new race, no longer under the dominion of Satan, no longer under the dominion of the law of sin and death, but now we are under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and now we are in him, so now we are to function the same way Jesus did, which was exactly, now think about this, Jesus functioned exactly how Adam was supposed to function. But Adam gave it away, so Jesus shows up in this world that now has been messed up by Adam. So now, think about this, Adam would have never had to deal with a sick person. <clears throat> he would have seen a lot of people, because he would have lived basically eternally. So he would have seen a lot of people, but there wouldn't have been sickness or disease because sickness and disease entered when death entered and death entered when sin entered, right? So Jesus had to come along and fix Adam's mess. <clears throat> Adam was the first Adam. Jesus, now listen, Jesus wasn't technically the second Adam. He was the last Adam. So there's a difference between being the second and the last. And I understand he's called the second man in that sense. But I want you to realize that what happened was there's not going to be another one. So we're not uh, in line, we're in him. Do you get that? See, he wasn't, uh, the first Adam wasn't the first Adam, uh, and then Jesus came along being the second Adam, and then you're, somebody was a third Adam, and then somebody else was the fourth Adam. And fit, No, it was Jesus was the last Adam, and everybody else is in him. So our life is in him. Just as all were dead, we're in the first Adam, all in the last Adam are alive. Amen? Now, <clears throat> watch this. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I know this is a lot of scripture, but if you'll write these notes down, go out, study them out, read them, focus on them a little bit, uh, <clears throat> you'll be amazed at some of the stuff you'll see through this. In, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to start in verse 45. <clears throat> now, remember, you could go back and study, and you should always go back and study before and after to make sure that what I'm saying is in context. Don't just take my word for it. Amen? Study this out, and, but read it in its total context to make sure that we're not just pulling it out and making it say something. But in verse 45, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. That would be the first Adam, of course. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And now watch. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall all, not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And then he talks and says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, 
For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So there is a change taking place. But now notice, notice what it says. So when this corruptible shall have put on, well, I guess I've got to go back to verse 53. Yeah, verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now we know this. Now notice what it says is going to happen. Corruption is going to put on incorruption. <clears throat> mortality is going to put on immortality. Is that right? Notice what it does not say. It does not say that the unglorified is going to become glorified. Is that right? It does not say that stupid is going to put on brilliance. Do you get that? Why? Because he expects us to grow up into him in all things. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says that we are to grow up into him in all things, which is ahead, even Christ, right? So we are to grow up into him now. And it says he is seated until his enemies are made his footstool. What does that mean? That means there's some things that aren't yet, they've all been put under him, but everything hadn't been put under him in, in, the, in the sense that they're all listening to him. So it is the job of the church to take these other things that have not yet submitted to him and put them under our feet because as we put them under our feet, we're putting them under his feet. Do you get that? And all things have been put under his feet, but we don't see all things under his feet. Why? Because the church hadn't done its job. And so the whole world is waiting for the sons of God to manifest and grow up and act like him. And when they do, they're going to start putting these things under their feet. Do you get that? And he is seated until all his enemies are made his footstool Amen? So there's a, there's a job we have to do yet. Now, understand, <clears throat> well, I want to get back in the Scripture. I, want to, I don't want to veer off too far. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And these are verses you know, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. One translation says a new species that never existed before. Right? I, like I said a while ago, a new race of being, you could call it. It says, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God. Do you hear that? So when you become a new creation in Christ, old things are passed away. All things have become new. And all things are of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is that right? Now notice, what got born again? When you got born again, your spirit, isn't that right? Your body didn't get born again, and your soul didn't get born again. Amen? Your spirit got born again. Now, notice, God, re when, when you came to Christ, you gave God permission to recreate you. He did that. When He recreated you, He recreated you perfect and complete in His image. In the spirit, you are just like Jesus. Do you get that? Now, what that, now, this is huge. This, is, this brings a lot of uh, ramifications with it because what that means is this. <clears throat> that means you technically don't need anything new. Do you get that? You don't need this new anointing, that new anointing, this thing, that thing. No, you have to realize it says that you are in, in him, you are complete. Is that right? Yes. You are complete, it says, in him. And what does that mean? Complete, for instance, when a baby's born, okay? Uh, I, we, my wife and I, we've had four children. Uh, we now have seven grandchildren. My youngest is about five, and my oldest will be turning 18 this year. And so we've got a wide range. Every one of them, right? As soon as they're born, first thing they do, you know, they bring them out and let you see them, and they close the curtain and all that kind of stuff, generally speaking. And so they bring them out. What, the first thing you do, you look at everything. You count everything. Isn't that right? Yeah. Two hands, two legs, you know, ten toes. Isn't that right? You know, the ears are there, the nose, everything, everything. And what do you say? Oh, thank God. They are complete. Isn't that right? Yeah. Now, they're complete. In other words, what that, what that means is this. When they're born, they're born with everything they're ever going to have. Isn't that right? Now, they're not mature. So what's the difference between being complete and being mature? Because the minute you got born again, you were born again complete, but you weren't born again mature. The difference is, see, being mature means you learn to use what you were born with. 
That's maturity. When you start to learn, you start to grow. See, when you, you're born, you know, two arms, two legs, and you don't know how to use them, you just lay on your back and flop around, right? But then at some point, you start figuring out these things, and you, know, and you, st you start hitting yourself in the face and sticking your hands and your feet in your mouth. You do that the rest of your life pretty much, too, sometimes. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> another whole thing there. But so at some point, though, you learn how to roll over, and pretty soon you start crawling. What are you doing? You're learning how to use what you were born with. Well, when you got born again, you were complete in him. Everything you need is in there. Now, you still have to develop it. You still have to learn how to walk in it. You still have to learn how to use it, but it's there. You are complete in him. You got that? Now, when you get born again, now think about this. When you get born again, your spirit is recreated, and it's recreated in the likeness of Christ. And by faith, you can meet any need you will ever have, right? And people say, well, what about the Holy Spirit? Well, he recreated your spirit, and, he, and your spirit now is holy in you. Isn't that right? But then people say, well, what about your, the, the, the Holy Spirit? You know, why do we need the baptism of the Spirit? Well, he said very clearly. He said that you will receive power, miraculous ability. After that, the Holy Ghost come upon you, Acts 1.8, right? And he says, and you shall be my witnesses. So you need the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses and to walk in miraculous power. Now, your faith can meet any needs you ever have. But if you're going to meet the needs of others, you're going to have to learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? To be a witness and to be able to perform the things. Now, your faith, all things are possible to him that believes. Isn't that right? So your faith will work for you. And matter of fact, your faith will even work for you, for others. See, I, I learned a long time ago, uh, over 20 years ago now, that if I, because I, I found out that God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Isn't that right? He'll meet all my needs. And when I started seeing that and he started meeting my needs, I realized he will meet all my needs. And then I started thinking, okay, how can I help those people? Well, it was easy. I made their needs my needs. And when I took them on and I said, their need is now my need, now God meets their needs because he meets my needs. And so I learned. Now, I will give you um, just a real quick secret here, and we'll probably finish up here in just a minute. A while back, I was able to go uh, spend a week of just spend a week by myself, just me and the Lord, and just thinking and praying and reading and writing and doing different things. And during that time, uh, they, it was a house that somebody provided for me to go stay in, and somebody picked me up at the airport, and they took me to this house, and then they brought me uh, we'd go out, they, they would come every afternoon and we'd go eat and then uh, I would come back but that was the only contact I had with humans was this man that would come pick me up and we'd go eat supper together and he, he didn't know anything really about me he had heard a little bit about me but didn't, didn't know that much and so we would talk and discuss things and so he was a very wealthy I didn't know this at the time but he was a very wealthy businessman and so he was asking different things about finances well I, you know, I didn't know why he would really ask me that but he started asking me about them. And so as we were talking about these things, I said, well, I said, well, I haven't prayed for myself for any of my needs in years. And he said, well, how, do, how are your needs met? And I said, he said he would meet my needs. I said, so there's no need for me to pray because the Bible doesn't say pray for your needs. It, it says your father knows what you need. Isn't that right? But it, it, and whenever it talks about prayer, it says pray for whatsoever things you desire. Well, I don't desire my needs. I need my needs. Isn't that right? There's some needs I have I don't desire. Isn't that right? And so I don't, those are not things I pray for. So I trust him. I expect him. Do you get it? I expect him to meet my needs. Why? Because he said he would. So now I fulfill the requirements for that. Why? Because what, what the people he said that to in Philippians were people that had partnered with Paul and were actually helping him further the gospel. And so I, I fulfill that in the sense that I help fulfill the gospel and I give and I do these things. But uh, you have to understand, I really don't, um, I really don't use sowing and reaping. I don't, I don't sow for something. I give, right? And I understand, and I know when I give, it is, it's, it is sowing. I get it. But I don't think in terms of I need something, so I'm going to give something. I, I don't do that. I think in terms of that person needs something or this, and I give it to them. Uh, and so in that sense. Now, but I started realizing, and when I told him, I said, well, I hadn't prayed for my needs in years. And, and he actually pulled over. We were driving down the road, and he pulled over the side of the road, and he, we were in a truck, and so he pulled over, and he stops and looks at me and goes, 
what do you mean you, don't, you haven't prayed for yourself in years? I said, well, I don't. God said he meets my needs. That's what he does. I said, I pray for my desires. He said, oh, okay, so you, you pray for the money. I said, no, 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 you understand. My desire is Bible schools being planted. My desire is the gospel being preached. My desire is churches being planted. That's, my, that's what I pray about. That's what I, to seeing the people of God receive the word of God, seeing people get a hold of this and ruin that. That's what I pray. I don't spend my time of communing with the Father asking for stuff for me, right? But I realize I don't have to. Now, the difference is this. Can you sow and, you know, is the law of sowing and reaping a law? Yeah, absolutely. But it's an earthly law. Te- technically speaking, it's an earthly law. He, because there will be an end to it. Because he said, as long as the earth is, sun and moon and all that, he said there will be harvest time, planting and harvesting. Isn't that right? So that's an earthly law. That's not a kingdom law. See, so the kingdom law, it is the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen? See, I, I know I've heard this before because, well, I've heard it. <laughs> but you technically can't sow yourself out of a crisis, right? Because sowing and reaping means planting, and then there's a time, and then there's harvest. And usually, harvest and planting don't run together, right? That's why they're sowing, and then there has to be a period of time. Now, that time can be drastically shortened, but there's still a time period. Now, the time between sowing and reaping, or as we sometimes would say, the time between praying and seeing it, Okay, that's called the mean time. Why? Because it's mean. That's why it's the mean time. That's the real mean time. Okay, it's the best way to remember. It. So, but it, now, so you can't sow your way out of a crisis. That's when you need a miracle, right? And so the miracle is understanding that you walk in the kingdom, and that whatever you need, whatever I need, will be there when I need it. Right? Do you understand that? Because whenever I realize that. Okay, just like when I drive, say, to California. If I'm going to drive to California, I don't sit down and say, okay, here's how many miles it is, and my truck gets this many miles per gallon, so I'm going to go buy this many gas cans, I'm going to fill them all up, and I'm going to make sure I have that many gallons of gas on the top of my Tahoe that I'm driving. I'm going to, I'm going to have it on top and because, you know, I've got to have prepared. I mean, I've got to be prepared all the way. Well, nobody does that. Why? Because somebody almost had somehow, almost like the mind of God, and said, you know what? Why don't we make provision for people to get gasoline along the road? And all they have to do is get where they need to be, and when they get where they need to be, they'll have the gas. The gas will be waiting for them to fill up again. And that's pretty much what it is. So a lot of times, the problem with most people is the reason they don't have the provision they need is because they're sitting on the side of the road saying, I need provision, I need provision. No, your provision is at the gas station. Get to the gas station. If you get where you're supposed to be, your provision's there. If your provision isn't there, you're probably not where you need to be. Just something to think about. <laughs> Amen. All right? But I'm telling you, that, see, this way, I don't, I don't spend my time fellowshipping with the Father asking for stuff for myself. I spend my time talking about the Word of God. I talk about Him. I talk about how awesome He is. I praise and worship these things, which are two different things, obviously. <clears throat> and so... In living this way, well, why? I'm starting to learn how to walk in this dominion in every realm, in every area, not just in, you know, healing. The healing is just a demonstration of it. But when if you see how Jesus walked, it didn't matter what he needed. And, and the thing is, he didn't, he, he always started with something, but he never asked for it for himself. When he fed the 5,000, it wasn't for him. Matter of fact, it doesn't even say he ate it. He just said he blessed it and broke it and gave it away, right? And, but it was multiplied through the hands of the, of the disciples, as, as we know. So now, <clears throat> notice here, because I'm going to get back on this. I don't want to go too far in there. <clears throat> but he says here, when you got born again, it said that all things are become new, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That's the ministry you have, right? Then he says, to wit or to know, to the end, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now look at verse 20. Now, then, we are we the ambassadors for Christ. Now, you get that? Now are we ambassadors for Christ. Why? Because now we are born again. We're, we're kingdom citizens. We're not born of this world. We're born of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're to think on things above, not on things on this earth. Isn't that right? 
And when we think on things above, what are we going to think on? Things that are pure and holy and good and good report. Isn't that right? Why? Because that's what's in heaven. So we live from there. See, if you go to Haiti, Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the world. You go there, if you, when you land on the plane there and you land at the airport, you're going to get off the plane and you're going to see poverty, severe poverty, all the way to the U.S. Embassy. When you get to the U.S. Embassy, when those Marines open that gate and you go inside, guess what? There's going to be no lack, none. Whatever you want is in there, food, drink, whatever, comfort, Everything you need is in that embassy. Why? Because the embassy does not take on the nature of the country it's in. The embassy takes on the nature of the country it represents. That's why we, as the church of God, should not take on the nature of the area we're in. But we should take on the nature of heaven and reveal that nature to the people around us where we live. We should be embassies of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen? Which means, listen, if, if Haiti goes through, I don't know how they could go through more recession, but if they went through some type of recession, the U.S. Embassy wouldn't even notice. Why? Because it doesn't go by the economy of Haiti. It goes by the economy of the United States. Amen? And when you learn to live by the economy of heaven, rather than letting circumstances dictate how you live, God will meet what you are expecting from now. Uh, just one more. One of the things in, uh, yeah, thank you for that. In the name, right now, watch this. In um, Ephesians, go with me to Ephesians real quick. Figure out where I'm going here. Yes, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> and look at, just show you some of this. Uh, yeah, okay. Go with me to verse, man, it's all good. Okay. You know what? Might as well just go to verse 1. Yep, we'll just start there. Verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, or in other words, for you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. What does that mean? That means that we're reading Ephesians, but really this should be Second Ephesians because he's already written a letter to them. It says right there, I wrote a four, and he's talking about writing a letter to them, so we don't have that one. Probably had too much Paul in it, not enough Holy Spirit. Verse four, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And now he's going to give us what an understanding of that. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of grace, of the grace of God, which given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Notice he's to preach the unsearchable riches. He's to preach things that you can't figure out. Why? By revelation. It means that it comes out of the Spirit of God. And to make, verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of that mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Why? To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So in other words, the church is to display the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers to show them because these principalities and powers that were made by God have now fallen and they're no longer serving Jesus and we are to display that wisdom. Now here's one of the things you have to realize. as the, Whatever the church starts talking about, principalities here. And so the enemy's job is to blind the eyes of people that have not received the gospel. So the first thing he does is he hears, oh, that's where the church is going. Okay, we got to get around ahead of this and we got to create a second thing. Now, what that is, is this. Did God promise Abraham Isaac? Did he promise, was Isaac the promised child? Okay. Now let me ask you this. You have Isaac, you have Ishmael. Which one was born first? Ishmael. Right? Which was not the promised child. Is that right? 
Isaac was. So now notice, as soon now, how did Ishmael come about? Because of the flesh. They tried to figure out a way to, to do God's will, right? But they did it in the flesh rather than waiting for it to be done by the Spirit. So usually what you'll always find is whenever God is getting something done in the earth, usually the enemy hears about it. When I say the enemy, I'm always referring to Satan, the devil, principalities, powers, demons, that kind of thing, okay? God, Jesus called him an adversary. Paul called him an adversary, okay? Which means enemy, same thing. So when the enemy hears, where, see, the enemy listens. And when the enemy hears where the church is going, he will try to look ahead, he'll get around it, and he'll try to produce an Ishmael before the Isaac can be born in the church. And so as that Ishmael is born, now it starts to draw the attention, and unfortunately most of the church is so, well, most of the church is not led by the Spirit, but rather by the booksellers and the bookstores. And so the enemy will start having things put in the bookstores that will actually cause the path of God to be veered off and will cause the move of God to be aborted before it's ever grown to full uh, strength, right? Now, this has happened with the manifested sons of God for years and years and years. There was even a move back in the 1940s called the manifested sons of God. And they were really good up to a point, and then they started thinking that there were levels, and they started thinking, because I'm, I'm a mature son and you're not, you must listen to me and I'll dictate your life. What were they doing? They were exercising dominion over people when they weren't supposed to. Amen. And when they did that, they got off of sonship, and now they started moving into religion, and they started moving into these things, and the, the plan of God, the move of God was aborted, and sons were not fully manifested and didn't get to grow up because people started seeing the wrong and started saying, I want nothing to do with that. Same thing happened in the 70s with the discipleship or shepherding movement. The, the discipleship, discipleship is a biblical principle and a biblical practice. But when it moved over into shepherding to the point where, what they called shepherding, where they started dictating what you drove, what car you bought, who you married, where you lived, what houses you could buy, what were they doing? They moved out of sonship, which is servanthood, and moved into dominion over people's faith, which even Paul said, we don't even have dominion over your faith. Amen? Do you see this? And so God, and about, usually about every 20 to 40 years, God does it again. He tries to bring it around again to see if the people are ready to receive it and walk in it. Well, we're, we're at that, actually, the 40-year mark of that again. And now it's time for us to actually grow up, do it right, and not try to exercise dominion over everybody, but to learn to serve. Amen. And if we learn to serve, how do we serve? Well, to serve, first off, you have to be a son of God. You have to be born again. If you're born again, you're a son of God, okay? Now, you can be a baby son of God. You can be a brand new son of God. You can be a carnal son of God, or you can be, actually be a spiritually minded son of God. Those are the basic of the four areas, or we would say three, that are actually in the son, right? The first one is represented out of the book of James, and that's for brand new Christians, brand new, right? And then if you want to go beyond that, you see First and Second Corinthians, which is written to the carnal church. And so that, that carnal, those are uh, sons of God, but they're carnal. They're, they're in the kingdom, but they're just carnally minded, right? And whenever you're carnally minded and not spiritually minded, then what ends up, because the, the, to be carnally minded is death. What does that mean? That means you don't learn how to actually exercise dominion over the things of your own physical body, right? Because carnally minded means fleshly minded, body minded. You let your body tell you rather than letting the word of God tell your body. And so, but when you become spiritually minded, now you start to walk by the spirit and you say what this book says is the truth. So body line up. And you start to walk in that, and you don't, you, you, you consider not the body, but rather you consider the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Now, you'll see this as we go along. And so now God is trying to bring that back around to where we start to serve. Now, as I said, to, to truly serve man, there's three parts. You might say, okay, you have to be, number one, you have to be a son of God if you're going to serve man. <clears throat> to serve man, you also have to be a master over the devil. All right? And then number three, you have to, to serve man, you actually have to serve man, right? So you have to be man's servant. To be man's servant, you've got to be the devil's master. And to be the devil's master, you've got to be a son of God. Is, is that simple? So the whole idea about being uh, born again and being a Christian is that we have to learn how to serve. And you listen, you cannot make the devil get off of a person. You can't heal a person, get a person healed, get, them, get the sickness or disease off of them if you're not a master over the devil. 
So to be a master, to actually serve man and set them free, you actually have to be, have dominion and authority over the devil, yes. right? And you get that by being a son of God. Amen. Amen? Now, to as many as received him, John 1, 14 tells us, to as many as received him, to them gave he power, authority to become the sons of God. So the minute you get born again, you're a son. You just have to grow up. Amen? Now, the minute you got born again, you were born again in your spirit. Your spirit was recreated. But your soul, and your, we would even say your mind in this case, right? Your body and your mind were not changed. But the Bible said, now notice, God changed your spirit, recreated you in the likeness and image of Christ. Then he says, now I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, right? Completely to God. And then he says, and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the only way your life is transformed, now, if you are sick, somebody can lay hands on you, you can be blessed, you can be healed, but that doesn't transform your life. A lot of people get healed, and they live for God for a little while, and then they go back to living like they did before, right? So that does not transform your life. The only promise of transformation that we have is to have your mind renewed to the Word of God. Now, how do you tell if your mind is renewed to the Word of God? It's real simple. When your mind is renewed to the Word of God, you do not think, what does the Word say? You think what the Word says. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. See, I know a lot of people that they have to say, okay, uh, well, what does the Word say? Okay, I'm having this problem. What does the Word say about that? Their mind's not renewed. When your mind is renewed, you automatically think what it says. See, it's not even that matter of what does the word say. It's just, why? Because this is your nature. This, you know what it says. It is written. It's been written in your heart and in your mind. And now it is in your mind to the point where you have the spirit of your mind renewed. And now you are walking with him and you think this way. Now, the, I'll give you an example. Years ago, I was in, um, I was traveling along, actually along 10, uh, came down to Houston, came across and was heading toward Florida. And as I was going across 10, I think I was in Mississippi. Yep. I, got, I stopped in Mississippi. It's as far as I got that evening. And it was starting to get real foggy. And so I was getting out. And I, if, you know, if I'm driving, I'm going to stay overnight. And if I'm going to stay a few days, I might stay in a better hotel. But if, if I'm, especially back in that day, uh, man, if I was traveling like that, uh, first Motel 6, that's where I stopped. I'd drop off there as quick as I could because that was the only type of hotels usually I could find that I could back up to and unload straight out of my car right in the door, right? And admitted they were usually very cheap and not usually too nice, right? It's just, but it was easy, and I'm only going to be there a few hours and usually five, six, seven hours, and then I'm gone again. So I pull up to this Motel 6, uh, and, and as I go in, it's getting really foggy out, and I don't think I had a phone that would tell me what the weather's going to be like or anything, and I wasn't really thinking in terms of dictating how the weather should be. At that point, I was still learning. And so I pull up to the back. I unload my car. I'm going to, as I go in, I turn on the television because I want to see if I can find the weather and what it's going to be like. So then I go back, and I'm unloading, you know, and I have to turn on the TV, and I'm letting it warm up. Shows you how old the hotel was and the TV. You know, remember, remember when they used to have to, the, the TV had to warm up a bit? Okay. So <laughs> just a few years back, Okay. And so I'm unloading my car, and about this time, the TV actually comes on when I'm carrying, I have some tubs and stuff with me, with my books and stuff, and so I'm putting them in there, and the TV comes on. And right when it came on, you know, back then when you turn it on, you don't know what channel it's going to be on when it comes on, right? And so I come in, and there's, right when it comes on, there's a woman crying, and she's on, uh, I, I couldn't really tell at the time, but she was on a witness stand kind of thing, and she's crying. And so I'm carrying this tub, and I hear this woman crying, and I stop, and I say, oh, Lord, help her, Lord. Bless. And I didn't realize it was a movie. <laughs> and so I put my hand, and I'm, I'm thinking, Lord, help her, and I realize it's a movie, and I'm like, you know, I didn't want anybody to see me do something stupid like that. And so I'm just, and the, but then the Lord said, why are you embarrassed? I said, because that looks stupid. I'm trying to pray for a person in a movie. And he said, no, he says it shows that your mind has been renewed to your first thought was to help. And that made a change in me. Amen? So the real key is learning when your mind is being renewed to the Word of God, the degree that your mind is renewed is dependent upon how, how much you don't have to think to do it. It's a natural... See, 
You know, I always hear people say, well, you know, this thing has to become your, your second, has to become second nature. No, it has to be your first nature. See, you didn't have to stop and think about how to sin. You just did it. Isn't that right? You ever notice back whenever you served the devil? Come Friday night, you weren't, you weren't, oh, devil, please tell me what you want me to do this weekend. <laughs> well, devil, do you want me to get drunk? I'll go get drunk, devil, if you want me to, but I don't want to do it if you don't want me to, devil. You, ever, you never did that. You just went and did it. Why? Because it was your nature. Then why do you think that you have to pray to go lay hands on the sick? It's your nature. Why would you have to pray? Why would God not want you to lay hands on the sick? Why would he not want you to feed the hungry? See, well, Lord, if you want me to, I'll do it. But you got to tell me, I need three signs, two witnesses, and a prophecy. <laughs> no, you don't. You got a book right here that says, whatever you would have done to you, do to others. There's your commission right there. Well, I don't know if I'm supposed to lay hands on the sick. Well, would you, if you were sick, would you want somebody to come lay hands on you? Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. There's your commission. Yeah. You say, well, no, Curry, see, I, but I think we have to be led. But that is being led. It says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Well, what's the Spirit of God? I thought this was written by the Spirit. Isn't that right? He says, my words are Spirit. So if you're led by his words, you're led by the Spirit. Amen? See, these are the things I learned from Dr. Sumrall. I started to realize and asking questions and things. But we have to realize that this should be your first nature, not your second nature. You don't have to stop and think and work through it. No, you just, it's a, this should be who you are. But if you don't know who you are, if you've never had your mind renewed, it won't ever become first nature. It'll always be second nature. Why? Because you've got it in your spirit, but it has to work through your spirit, out of your spirit, through your soul, and then your body has to be engaged, right? So God recreated your spirit. Then he said, okay, now if you want to walk with me, get your mind renewed so it's in alignment and present your body so that whatever your mind tells it to do, your body will obey. It's real simple. Amen? Listen, Jesus did not come to start a new theology. He didn't come, he didn't go to Jerusalem and start, you know, the Jesus seminary. He didn't come, he came to teach us relationship with the Father. He came to show us the love of God and told us to love others the way he loved us. And then we turn it into this theology. And now, and then as soon as we do that, well, let's start dividing. Let's start, you know, you, no, you don't believe like this? Forget you. I, I, you know, no, love. Right? If they don't believe like you if, you, if you're sure you're right, then work with them until they get it. Keep sharing it with them. Amen? Now, if they don't want to listen, you can't make them. But you shouldn't be the one to cut them off. Does that make sense? We're just to love one another. And if we do that, then we're just sharing. You know, one of the things I've learned, you keep feeding as long as people are eating. When they quit eating, quit feeding. Right? Worst thing you can do as a preacher is keep talking after you've not when you're not saying anything. <laughs> okay. So, so, okay. So, back in Ephesians. Back in Ephesians. We're almost done here. Okay. <clears throat> Look what he says here. In verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause, I bow my, knee, my knees under the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You hear that? That name that we use, the name of Jesus, is not just his name, it's our name. Right? <clears throat> that he would, now watch this, here's what he's praying, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now watch what that means. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, and this is the only way you're going to be able to do it, is to be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend. So if you're not rooted and grounded in love, you're not going to be able to comprehend. Do you get that? To comprehend what? With all saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. You're supposed to know something that's beyond knowing. Now think about that. That's a deeper knowing than just knowing, right? That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now that's exactly what it said about Jesus, that in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Isn't that right? 
And he says, that's his will for you. But you only do that if you know the love of Christ, which is beyond knowing. You got that? Now watch it. Verse 20. Here's a big one. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Now think about this. When I, when I got this, man, it was amazing. The highest form of faith is not asking and believing. The highest form of faith is expecting. In other words, see, I expect God to meet my needs. Why? Because he said he would. So I don't pray about it and fast about it and do this thing. No, if it's a need and he knows, he knows what I have need of, that's what Matthew 6.33 tells you, isn't that right? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Why? Why? Because he knows what we have need of even before we ask him, right? So to expect without even saying. Now understand, I'm, I'm a firm believer in saying, okay? You speak and dominion and authority is released through speaking, first and foremost, first and foremost. But I want to show you something. If you get this, it's how you turn this around because you can spend, okay, you can spend the rest of your life putting out fires that the devil starts to keep you running in circles. Or you can get ahead of him and expect, have faith in God that he is guiding your steps and that he is going before you and that he is making things right so that by the time you get there, you're, the problem's already solved. Do, do you get that? Yes, now watch this. Look what he says. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. You see, I know very few Christians that actually walk there. Almost every one of them only get what they ask for. And see, you can only ask for what you can think. You can't ask for something you can't think. So here he says he can do exceedingly abundantly above what we can even ask or think. So if you're going to pray, you got to think before you ask. Isn't that right? But here he says he can do exceedingly abundantly even above what we can even ask or think. So that means that, that he can do beyond what we can even think to pray about. That means that he can go before you and raise these things up so that your way is, is provided for even before you said. Now, when that happens, see, you're expecting. See, I, I expect things to go my way. I expect blessings. I expect things to happen good. I, I don't expect trouble. You know, I don't expect that, well, you know, because I, I go overseas a lot and I'm all over the place and I lay my hands on all kinds of people with all kinds of diseases and all this kind of stuff and most of it's contagious. I've never caught it, never brought it back home, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's funny because people, well, I remember the first time I started going over, my mother-in-law, she was so nervous. She said, you're going to go over there and catch something, bring it back and kill us all. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I said, I'm not going over there to catch anything. I'm going over there to kill some things, right? <clears throat> so, <laughs> but that was just the way she thought about it, right? But the, the, the key is I expect, and it, it's funny because when you expect things to go your way, when you expect God's blessings to be part of your life. See, I've never understood most Christians because it said, even in the old covenant, it said all these blessings will overtake you. It doesn't say you're going to chase them down. And yet you got most Christians that are chasing blessings. Everyone, I'm going to do that. I'm going to sow for this blessing. I'm going to sow for that blessing. I'm going to get this blessing. I'm going to confess this blessing. Bless, and I'm going to confess and confess. And I believe in, and well, I don't even call it confessing. I, I, what I do is I agree with the word. I agree with God. What he said, he said, by his stripes I'm healed. I agree with him. By his stripes I'm healed, right? I don't go around and I'm, yeah, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. I, I agree with God. By his stripes I'm healed. There you go. Now, at what second do I not believe that? Well, I believe it every second. So I believe in divine health, right? So if I believe that I'm always healed, then I can't get sick because there's no gap in there to get sick. See, to get healed, you got to get sick. And it's, it's awesome to get healed every time you get sick. But it, I'll make up a word. It's even awesomer, okay, <laughs> to not need healing because you live in divine health. Amen? Amen? Now, in, in, in what I do, I have to believe in divine health. Why? Because I'm touching sick people every day. Amen? And then people ask, what do you think about this coronavirus? I don't. Why? Uh, aren't you afraid you might catch it? If I do, I'll kill it. You know? I'm trying to catch it so I can kill it. Amen? And it runs from me. 
Why? Because it knows I'll kill it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? But when you learn to walk this way, you start to realize again, things happen before, and it, it's amazing. You, you'll, things happen that you hadn't even thought about, but you know. And, you, and yet, and when they happen, you're like, God, you're awesome. I didn't even ask you for that, and you did it. But you know I needed it, and here it is, and now I got it right when I need it, and thank you for it. And you, now my whole life is lived in gratitude. I spend my time thanking him and just driving down the road thinking, hey, you're awesome. You're just amazing. You know, I just I bust out laughing sometimes. <laughs> it's just like, amen. Cause, and, and what really, when I really laugh the hardest is when the people, are, uh, not necessarily people around me, but when people will say, I don't know why God did that for him, you know? I mean, I'm a better Christian than he is. I'm like, that's because that's you're not, my God's better, I guess. I don't know what it is, you know? <laughs> like Jesse Duplantis says, God just likes me. I, I don't know, you know? Just, <laughs> he can't help himself, you know? He just likes me. So I don't know. But I expect him, right? But because of that, I don't limit God to what I can think or ask. I let him be God. If, I mean, think about it. If I can only limit him to what I can think or ask, then he is limited to my finite mind at where I'm at at any given time. But why not let him be God and let him do things that I hadn't even thought about yet and then whenever I catch up to it, I'm like, whoa, that was awesome. You know, and just live in the blessing of God. And it's amazing. You know, I don't have problems. It's amazing. People around me have problems and sometimes I get drug into their problems, but I don't have problems. My life is amazing. My life is blessed. I'm a blessed person. And yet you see people that always got this stuff going on. And you're like, why do you live there? It's so much better to live here, you know? And, and then they try to drag you into there, and you're like, no, I got nothing to do with it. Well, you know how it feels whenever you feel it? No, I don't, I don't understand that. No, why? Because that's not who I am anymore. Amen? I'm not saying I can't remember. I'm just saying I choose. Do you realize when God said about your sins, you know what he said? He said, I will remember their sins no more. He didn't say he'll forget them. He said, I will not remember them. What does that mean? He has set himself not to remember. So you ever see somebody, they start talking, you know where they're going? You know, you know right where they're going, right? And you know where they're going down the road? You ever thought, thought and told them, wait, 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 stop, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I hear what you're saying. I know where you're going. I don't want to go there. Thank you. Bye. Why? Because I'm not going down that road. There's things I don't, there's things I don't want to remember. Isn't that right? And I choose not to remember them. Why? Because if I remember them, I might have to forgive somebody. As it is, I just live dead to it. And it's a whole lot easier because I don't take offense, right? But when you don't take offense, when people do things against you, then if you don't take the offense, that offense goes toward God, if you're walking with God. And then that's why we have to pray for those people that despitefully use us, the people that come against us, those that curse us. We have to bless them. Why? Because if you don't, that, that'll, that'll resonate in their life. They reap the, the, not the benefit, but the consequences of it. Amen. So we have to forgive. We have to do this. Why? Not because we're bearing this, uh, you know, this offense, because you realize it's wrong to take an offense, right? So that when you take an offense, the first thing you have to do is get forgiveness yourself. So just don't get offended. How do you not get offended? Die. Real easy. Dead people don't get offended. Amen? You know, you ever go to a funeral, walk up there, and there's that dead body? And you look down in there, and you go, wow, you're just as ugly as you ever were. And that person's just laying there. They don't even, don't even flinch. Why? Because they don't get offended. They're dead. If you don't get offended, you don't have to live, you don't have to always walk around, well, is there anything, is there any unforgiveness in my life? There is no, un, there is no unforgiveness in my life. Why? Because I refuse to get offended. Amen? Now, how do, you, how do you not get offended? Easy. Don't expect anything from anyone but God. Isn't that something? See, when you don't expect anything from anybody but God, it makes it easy. He will never let you down. Amen? He's got Amen. good Amen. for you. Amen? He knows the thoughts he has for you, thoughts of good, not of evil. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, we got most of this done tonight. We did pretty good there. We got, got most of it. We'll uh, pick this back up in the morning. Now, did you get anything out of this tonight? Yes. Because I'm trying to give you some of the principles that I don't always get to in, in a lot of the DHDs that we do, and I'm trying to get these principles because if you understand this, this is the last thing. We'll stop right now. When you understand the original position and then you understand the position that Jesus put us back into and now we walk in the position that he walked in and because we're in him 
and all that authority he has, all authority was given to him, guess what? That's the authority you have. Why? Because you're in him. It's no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. So don't think about, well, I've been a little good, so I got a little authority. No, I've been a little bit better this week, so I got more authority this week. No, that's not how it works. It's his all. Amen? And you walk in his all authority. When you do that, it doesn't matter how big the mountain is in front of you. His authority works. It doesn't matter how big that sickness is. doesn't matter what that disease is. doesn't matter what the problem is. No, you just stand and speak and agree with God's word. And when you do, you will walk different because you realize you're an ambassador. You start to walk different. Yeah, I was in the U.S. military. Yes, yes. And I, I know God orchestrated that because it taught me. When I got up in the morning, I was curry. I walked across to that locker. When I put on that uniform, I wouldn't curry anymore. I represented the United States Air Force. I walked different. I talked different. I knew that there were actions I couldn't do because... I would be bring disrepute onto the, onto the branch, onto the Air Force. I knew things I would get in trouble, you know, uh, conduct unbecoming, right? I understood that. And so when I saw that in Dr. Summerall, I realized all of that that God was doing was geared toward getting me to functioning in this dominion and in the authority of Jesus Christ. And you start to realize, what, what can the enemy do to me? Nothing. He can't kill me. If he could, he would have done it. Right? He would have done it right before I got born again. He couldn't kill me. He can't take me out. Amen? It's just like the song I was singing last week. I can't be defeated, and I won't quit. Well, the only way you get defeated is if you quit. So just don't quit. If you don't quit, you can't be defeated. If you can't be defeated, all of a sudden you get this whole different way of living because you realize, I don't care how bad it looks, it'll turn to my favor because I know how to trust God. Amen? And then you start to speak and you start to command and things will line up according to the word of God and according to your will because your will is God's will. When you make God's will your will, then you can command according to that will and it will be done. Amen? He said very simply, I'll tell you how to do that, real simple. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatsoever you will and it shall be done. That's all you got to do. Get this in you, abide in this, let him abide in you, then whatever you say will come to pass. Amen? Amen. It's a good life to live. You ought to jump in. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. God bless. Brother.